Now Sweeney. Dwayne Sweeney. Sweeney's over. Can you please hand it over to your captain, Dwayne Sweeney? Welcome to Real Tales with Sweens, proudly brought to you by Fish City Hamilton. Fish City has been servicing the Waikato's fishing, boating and outdoor needs for over 30 years. Now, with the help of their online store, their great range of products and outstanding customer service are available across New Zealand. This episode, I sit down over coffee with David Galbraith. DG is well known for his work as a mental skills coach, having worked with the Chiefs, New Zealand Sevens and Japan Rugby. His skills are also utilised by High Performance Sport New Zealand, where he works with a number of Olympic athletes including New Zealand's most successful Olympian of all time, Lisa Carrington. During this podcast we get some great insight into dealing with elite athletes at the top of their game. DG shares some background into his journey to becoming one of New Zealand's most renowned mental skills coaches, including how his rural upbringing shaped his character, dealing with serious offenders in life or death situations, and how speaking to a club rugby team on a cold winter's night changed his life forever. We also discuss the impact he had on my professional rugby career, and so much more. As always, the show notes will be available on Real Tales with Sween's Instagram and Facebook pages, as well as the website, realtaleswithsween's.com. Good George have a 15% discount available for all you listeners. Just use the discount code REALTALES before checking out of their online store. The link for their store is available on the realtaleswithsween's.com homepage. Lastly, I want to say a special thank you to DG for coming on and sharing some great insight with us. It was awesome to reconnect, mate, and I can't wait for the next one. So join me as we get to know David Galbraith. Enjoy the podcast. Makes a completely different coffee. Yeah, it does, eh? Mm. Yeah, well, that's what I noticed a lot too, because I've got an espresso machine at home, mm. like a, a really good one, mm. and you got to have good milk because it just ruins the coffee if you don't yeah, yeah. have the cream in it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't understand how people have like almond milk and stuff. Yeah, right. I can't either. Like, well, what's the other one? Um, oat, milk. oat. Yeah, it's like oats for eating. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure it can't be milk. It must be just like juice. Yeah, totally. Imagine. How can they call that milk? That's not milk. Yeah, yeah. It's actually. I love to watch someone try and milk an oat. <laughs> How many oats you have to have in your herd? Oh, I know. <laughs> How big's your herd? 75,000. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Milk them all by hand. Yeah. There's things in life which are... Have you got a teaspoon, DJ? Yeah. Do that with? Yeah. There's certain things in life that aren't supposed to be um, yeah. mucked around with. I mean, basics. Leave it alone. Yeah. I have this interesting theory... And you'll probably agree with me, but I reckon a lot of what happens to the human body is what you tell it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And the more I learned, I suppose, like through my career and stuff, I kind of learned that. But when I reckon if you had two kids, you know, like same genetics, and then you separate, like even like twins, separate them at birth, put one in a world where everything bad was good and vice versa, and then they grew up that way, they would be healthy and the rest of it just because their whole psyche is like that's good for me that's not yeah and then the way that they went through their life i reckon mm. would mm. yeah the perspective is everything yeah it's unreal like even you know you talk to athletes that are going through the hole and they'll come to you depressed mm. and that's what someone will ring you for can you see so and so because i'm really worried about them mm. And then you'll be like, let them talk about it. And then you'll say to them, okay, what's the gift? And they're like, what? And you're like, well, what? And I heard you, and you sound like you're, it's tough. And they're like, yeah, yeah. So what's the gift? And I go, I can't see it. And I go, no, that's why you're struggling. It feels like the universe has just kicked you up the ass and told you the recipe you've been living by ain't the recipe. Mm. So if you hadn't had this moment, yeah, you could be another five, ten years down the track of suffering. Yeah. But the gift is 
thump, whatever it is, is giving you the, um, or got your attention. Yeah. Now you know you need to change. Now you need to change. Hey. And they're like. That's what I love about talking to you, DG. You make everything so simple. <laughs> C minus at university. It was even the other day when you come and spoke to us at um, with the Tupu program with mm. the kids, mm. and afterwards all the staff. Were, I think the staff got more out of it than the kids because they can comprehend it a bit better. Yeah. But they were just like, "Oh my god, that was amazing!" I was like, "Yeah, it is." And I was like, "But did he tell you something that you didn't already know?" Mm. And then they like thought about it, and I could see them really mm. thinking about it. Mm. They're like, "What do you mean?" And I was like, "Well." It's all common sense. It's all common sense. It's all what we get told all the time. Like, don't let other, others' opinions, mm-hmm. you know, um, change the way you live your life. Yeah. And your that doesn't shift your focuses and what you want to do or what you're good at or what you find enjoyment in. Yeah. Like, it's all just perception of mm-hmm. someone else. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, oh, oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> and I was like, that's why I, 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 I guess that's probably why I had a, really instant change myself once I started dealing with you and my own personal performance is because I got that straight away for well, whatever reason, yeah. the way you came across, yeah. I was just like, Oh, that's, mm. that's the secret. Like mm. that's the key. And mm. then it still doesn't. And I said this to the staff the other day too. I was like, it still doesn't pull me. Uh, it's still like that stuff still happens to me, but it doesn't pull me down the same way because I'm like, okay, yeah, this is happening. I'm aware of it what I need to do to change it mm. rather than thinking like, Oh, this sucks. And, mm. You know, oh, I, I can't see a way out here. I'm just like, all right. Okay. That's, and I think it annoys my wife a little bit because a lot of stuff I can just brush off and then, but it really, especially when I was playing, like if people would make comments about me or mm. something would go up on social media, mm. really, really affect her. But I, it didn't bother me because I'm like, well, who are they? Like, what does it matter? Like it doesn't matter. Oh, my performance has nothing to do with them or their comments or whatever and it doesn't change me as a person whether that's a good comment or a bad comment it's still the same yeah. but yeah and I think it frustrates her that I can just brush things off and carry on and she's like oh you you just don't even care <laughs> well, that's the secret <laughs> mm. so the same as what Mark Manson says I love the way he says it you know you've got to get clear what you're going to care about People give way too many cares about too many things. Mm. And you know, obviously he's got that book, subtle art not giving a fuck, and it's like it's, again, just such basic common sense. And you're right, the stuff really just helps people. Help. I think it, 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 it seems to give them permission to do it. Because you're right, it's common sense. Mm. They get it. They understand the metaphor. It makes sense to them. And then it's just like, oh, and it's just like that little moment where they're like, so it's okay to be like that. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay to follow your inner world. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. Mm. Right. Cool. All right. Well, we're using a lot of good podcast content here, DG. Mm. But I suppose one thing I did want to talk about, um, because there is so, well, there's a lot. Like we could sit here all day. Good. Um but I understand you're limited on time. Yeah. So I figured let's make this a segment yeah. kind of podcast and we'll catch up, you know, over time down the track and yeah. we'll, we'll do lots of little things and we'll pick topics and, and go for it from there. But one thing I did really want to talk about, and this is something that I've been trying to get across with the podcasters, that I guess the psyche of a professional athlete or an elite athlete and someone that's under immense pressure constantly in day-to-day life mm how relatable that is to the so-called real world. Mm. And that's one thing that I have I think I've been able to do effectively through mm. the podcast is a lot of people are like, oh, man, you rugby players are just like me and that person might be a fisherman or mm. they might be a mm. cyclist mm. or, you know, not, not even athletes, people that are running businesses have got the same, exact same things and exact same pressures. Mm. They just have a different title. Mm. Um, so I suppose I'd be really, really keen to – to talk with you and I can share a little bit also mm. on my personal Absolutely. experience through that and, and how you helped me. But yeah, just that, that dealing with elite athletes and you know, we touched on it a little bit there, you mm. know, being stuck in the hole or in mm. the dark place. And I guess 
with the with the things or constants that you've noticed mm. with athletes so over time and over mm. your time so just so for a little bit of background for credentials can you just sort of i suppose tell the listeners what teams you've <laughs> worked with teams and athletes yeah absolutely I, it's one of those things eh, that when you when you do what you love with who you love you start to rack up some successes so I never set out to do the things I've done, but then just followed. You know, like we were saying before, when we met, two thousand and eight. I've been working with Hotapu Cambridge Premier Rugby Team for three years before that, and then I was asked to do a little mental health, mental health, um, mental skills talk at rugby in Wellington, because there were about five of us around the country working in rugby. But I wasn't working, it was still, still my hobby because I was a clinical psychologist with the child, youth and family and the police um, with the child abuse side of things. And so I was doing Tuesday, Thursdays trainings, Saturday game on the bus with the boys and the wife said, uh, when are you going to start making some money because you're away from the home? <laughs> I'm not doing this. And I went, I hadn't even thought about that. <laughs> and then long story short, um, I was doing this little talk in Wellington and I was just starting and there's only like six of us in this in this room, one of the old building, the old waterfront um, site where the rugby union was. And in their big downstairs room and the doors opened and in walked all the super coaches. So Ian Foster, Colin Cooper, Blackadder, I think. That that crew. Mm. And then they sat down and then the doors opened again and in walked Ted, Shag and Smithy, and they sat down and the officer later said, oh, carry on, no, they'll just come in to listen to what we're talking about. And I probably talked about 30 seconds to a minute and um, Wayne Smith put his hand up and said, I can't understand what you're talking about, I completely disagree. <laughs> and I was like, oh, cheers, Smithy. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, long story. Frankly, in yeah, New Zealand. That's right. Um, long story short, um, Posse came up to me afterwards and said, "Oh, where are you based?" And then that was Hamilton. He said, "I'll oh, come in and you can meet the coaches." And that was Jaime and Robbo. That was them. You know, I made yeah, it Stormy. Been. Oh, or was it Stormy come the next year? Yeah, uh, Storm, Stormy came the next year as a like a skills that's assistant. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so I talked with them, and then he, and I think there was like, you may have been in that group, but then yeah, I was there. there's nine or so of you guys sat down and listened to me in that little far data room. Mm. <laughs> that was the pathway one, pathway two that's speech. Right. That's right. And I that, tell a lot of people that. That's a good one. Oh, it's so good because yeah. it's so true. It's so true. Yeah. So true. You know, that's where it started, and then it just went nuts from there because there wasn't anyone really working psychology. It was Gilbert and Oka with the All Blacks. Rod Corbin was with rowing. Gary Hermanson was with the New Zealand Olympic team, and then that was it. There was no one else, and then it just took off because everyone was wanting some mental skills. Mm. And because I was a psychologist, I was already in front of the wave. So obviously you and I met each other then, and then I was with, with the boys for 11 campaigns with the Chiefs. Um, I came on board pretty much the same sort of time with the Sevens, so I was with Gordon Titchens for 10 years. Still with them now with Clark Laidlaw. Um, high performance sport, three Olympics. Um, I'll finish off with Paris, that's the fourth one. Um, I was with Japan in the World Cup. So rugby's been the big part of my work. Mm. And then some individual athlete campaigns on the Olympic pathways um, or place, stage. Um, Oh, I worked with the Magic when they when they won in 12. 12 was a good year because the Chiefs won. Mm. Magic won. I think Lisa won. Did Lisa win her first gold medal in 12? I think that was London. Yeah. Yeah, so Lisa, Lisa had a great year. So that year, Lisa had a great year. The Magic did the impossible. The Chiefs did something which no one thought they could. Mm. So it was a hell of a year. I remember, yeah. I remember <laughs> seeing with the Rens and Smithy because that's a long story. I met, obviously, Smithy came to the Chiefs and he and I became, and still are, like, Work really closely together, and then um, I remember Ren saying, when we we're doing reviewing the campaign, he, I'm looking across me, going, "It's been a good year, DG." <laughs> <laughs> I went, "Yeah, it is." 
<laughs> so yeah, I guess that's probably the background. Clinical psychologist by training into sport from a hobby. Mm. And then there's been some wonderful opportunities to be surrounded by some amazing coaches like Wayne Smith that then allowed me to find my way. Yeah. Because I was learning the whole time how sport role versus, you know, serious offenders. Pretty much the same, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I was just lucky around. Great, there were some great, some great men in those days, including yourself, where I was able to learn how to roll, and that really shaped me. And then obviously, Fozzie was very, um, how do I say it? Fozzie was very understanding and very um, permitting of me making mistakes and not being sure how to do my groups. Mm. And that was really where I established my group work in rugby. So he was perfect timing because he didn't have any expectations on me. He liked to run his own ship, as we know with Fozzie. Mm. So he wanted people that weren't going to be um, destructive, but he didn't. As long as they weren't damaging, he was he was fine. And so he 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 and I had lots of conversations after groups about what worked well, what hadn't worked well. So he was key. And then obviously with Renz and Smithy and Tom Coventry and Andrew Strawbridge, that that was a huge period of really understanding the high performance picture in sport. Mm. So that I'll I'll look back on those years with them and feel very grateful for what they allowed me to be part of that established the way that I just roll out wherever I go now as the you know like it's the non-negotiables yeah so that would be the that would be the background um, now I'm just I'll finish off with this Paris Olympics um, and there'll be the sevens and and I'm learning how to be a sheep and beef farm or more Herefords now Herefords are my thing yeah Herefords and horses that's what my well, I've got a little farm but I want to get a bigger farm off the back of Paris on full time. Yep. And it's going to be Galbraith's, maybe Galbraith Stables or Galbraith Stud, and it'll be a boutique Hereford Stud. Well, it might be a commercial herd because, you know, you can do just the same sorts of things. We've got a very good commercial herd now, uh, about 100 cows and horses. Yeah. So it's gone from serious offenders <laughs> back to the land. Yeah, some great but problems. the land's always been a big part of your life too, because eh? yeah. I remember when you coming in first spoke to us, yeah. you were a possum trapper by trade That's right. prior to yeah. the psychology. Yeah, is, so I grew right. up on a farm. Mum and Dad were shepherds and managers who have never owned. I was trapping, I was pretty much trapping possums full time at age, probably, definitely age 13, 14, but started trapping possums when I was seven. I had seven years old, I was running 15 traps. Um, which is quite a few traps when there's a lot of, there are a lot of possums then. Mm. So it's not like they are now in many areas with the 1080, there's possum numbers and nothing. Like we'd go out, if we're shooting, we'd shoot 50 to 100 possums in a night. And I'd be trapping. When I was, when I was a teenager, I was running 30 traps. So seven years old running 15 traps, you, you're underway. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I was, possums were, I think that's the, that, you know, that's the benefit of growing up rurally. Mm. You're never short of work works just whatever you can think of you can make money i was doing possums and plucking rotten sheep because yeah, <laughs> the old man would just come home and say oh there's a couple of dead ewes down the back face and there was a big farm that he was a shepherd on yep. and i'd go and just i'd go hard and race down there get the wool yep. 10 bucks wool because scara comes around he just take on my wool give me some cash <laughs> it was as yeah, great as a young man so that that farm beginnings hunting it was a founding, I reckon it's the founding of my character. And then at 13, I was hunting, you, know, you wouldn't be allowed to do it now, and Sips would probably get involved. Dad would just drop me off at the end of the road in the Hawke's Bay underneath the Rohini Ranges. 13 years old, had an old 303. I'd say I'll see you in three or four days. Then off <laughs> I'd go. And now, you know, I just look back and go, that was that was key. Mm. And it's Built a lot of strength of character. Yeah, self-reliance. Yep. And my greatest strength is my greatest weakness because, you know, I know now myself as I'm quite set on my ways and I've had to work hard as a dad to let my daughters do stuff because cause back then I had to do it. And the old man was like that. You want a job done properly, you do it yourself. Mm. <laughs> that's, a, that's a real deep part of my nature. So, yeah, so it was the founding. That was the founding uh, where I started um, then into psychology, which I didn't really... Uh, wasn't, it wasn't an intentional thing. I took a year off from college to uni and 
did a season, taught myself to share and did a season sharing and knocked off my 200. Um, that killed me. You know, I was in pain every day. So I never want to go and share a sheep again. I'll do the <laughs> odd one, but yeah. uh, it's not something that's very pretty enjoyable. Um, it was that year. And then I went to Canterbury to see if I was any good at footy, and I wasn't, like I mentioned the other day. And I worked under the Yukon for a season as a hunting guide in between my undergrad and master's. And I still think to these, you know, I look back these days and go, why did I come home? Yeah. I only came home because the old man said, you know, because obviously the old man's a big part of my life. And he said, well, you can go to Canada, but you've still got to finish your university because that was mm-hmm. a deal. Yeah. So I'd done my undergrad, went and worked for a year up in the Yukon. Uh, well, the Yukon, BC border. Um, and then came back and then finished off my psychology from there. And then just ended up coming back to sport because after my daughters were born, there was, I found it very difficult to work with men that abuse children mm. and realised I wasn't going to do, I, you know, I'd get up and go to work and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the conversations you'd have with um, people that were really at a point of having to change or their lives was done because mm. you know, they weren't going to get out. They were great. Now, those conversations are so raw because there's no, it's life and death. So I enjoyed that, but realised it wasn't, I don't want to do that for 50 years. And that's where I started into sport. I just started, I'd sit down at night because I didn't have a TV um, and just started writing ideas about what it could look like as a programme. And then I spoke to a number of coaches for two or three years trying to get into club footy, like Trahonga, Old Boys, Marist, and then Hotapu was where it kicked off. Who was coaching at Hotapu then? Was Andrew Douglas was oh, just yeah. starting, yeah. So that was the point. Where he was just no, clever out. man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah he, good foresight. So he, I met him, and he said, "Right, you're in." Went to the first training, and it was Thursday night, pissing down with rain, southerly all night. I had just just ran around, and helped throwing balls back, and lazy do a training like I did with yeah. us. Same thing. And then he goes at the end of training, the boys have gone in the change room. He said, "Right, you have ten minutes. See if you're any good." <laughs> <laughs> and I look at him. Yeah. But I thought that might happen, so I was ready for it. Yeah, yeah. And then I just told them the Frank and Fabio story. Yeah. That I told oh, you guys. Yeah, they would have loved it. And honestly. It's dude, the best changing room, like, yeah. you know, boy. Yeah. Or male orientated. Yeah. Um, conversation. Conversation you could That's have. Because right. it, yeah. it's, it sums everything up perfectly, especially around, like, what we spoke about earlier, mm. the perception mm. of, mm. you know, and mm. it, it doesn't actually matter. Mm. Like, you know. Exactly. It doesn't matter what you've got. Yeah. It's your mindset. And then that was that ended up being like 45 minutes, that chat. I, I just well, I own that story. Well, we weaved the story for 45 minutes, and, man, they laughed. And then the next week, I rock up on the Tuesday, and the captains have obviously gone to um, Andrew and said, don't you ever put him in after training again. So I was before training in the club rooms while the boys were still in their good kit or yeah. coming from work. Yeah. And I never left the chain. I never left the club room. So all my talks here, because I just do a group talk each week. Yeah, yeah. And I got graduated up from the club room, I mean the change room after training to the <laughs> <laughs> in the club rooms when they were still in their good clothes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, that, and then they went pretty good. So Like it is a long speech, but can you summarise that? Because I know the listeners mm. will be sitting there going, oh, what is this? Well, essentially, I, I wrapped a story around two men, both really interested in Tyra Banks, <laughs> um, but one man was really well endowed and one wasn't. And then I just broke that down into the, I guess, a metaphor of people get caught up on what they've got and think that's what's going to limit or permit them to achieve their dreams, when really the key limitation is the way they think about themselves and think about what they've got and think about the... I guess the recipe of what it's required to be great, mm. and that that's probably the core of the metaphor to the story. And they're both chasing an impossible dream, which was to marry the most beautiful woman at that time in the world. And both the men had grown up together in the same schools together, the same opportunities together. So everything else was the same, bar their perspective. Mm. And the perspective was based on one one physiological thing. Um, but it had massive ramifications for how they thought about themselves. They thought about um, the way the world operated around them and what the rules were and whether that, you know, things were going to work out for them or not. So I just broke that 
basic story down into a way that men would enjoy it and understand it. And I, I took in three brooms. So I had a broom for Tyra Banks with beautiful, long, flowing hair, and I had a real stort, stubby broom for Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and then a really nice broom for the main actor was Fabio. Ben May. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And the irony was it's the same speech I did with you guys, mm. of the one I used at Hotapu. And oh, I've told it the same impact. so many times to people. Yeah. And then when they hear it, they, yeah. they, they, like, they get it, you know. Yeah. It makes so much sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. So that was, that, that story I spent a lot of time building around what I knew would be the opportunity. Mm. So there are key moments in people's lives where opportunity comes if you're not ready because if I hadn't had that story ready and I'd gone in and given a mental skills talk to those boys at Hotapu, they would have gone, who the f- is this guy? Mm. If that's psychology and sport, we're never going to have anyone in here. Mm. Um, and that would have been the opportunity gone and then nothing else after that would have worked. I wouldn't have been involved with them. Um, we wouldn't, wouldn't have met. Wouldn't have met Fozzie. I would have still sucked. We at wouldn't rugby. have met. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. You still would have been absolute <laughs> cop case. <laughs> <laughs> and then none of it would have happened. Um, so it is ironic that again, you know, we'll talk about various things over time when we chat. But you can't go past preparation and the hard yards, and there is always a price you have to pay. You cannot. Have, Cannot, it doesn't matter who you are, you cannot escape it. And the universe don't care who you are. The universe is like the bank and it only accepts it. By the way, I look at it. The universe is like a bank and there's only one currency and it's effort. You get the effort right and you've got a good team around you, you're going to do okay. And if you're any good, you're going to do real good. Mm. And then it's just like, well, we'll find, find out how good you are. And then it's like you and I were saying before, some people have better coordination. It's just a genetic thing. Mm. So some people come to a space with more genetic potential. You combine that with great coaching, great work ethic, openness to learn, um, and you've got something pretty special. But a lot of people don't understand that the universe keeps track of the score or keeps track of the currency, and people try and cut corners. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I was watching this thing in China, actually, where they've got or it's social credit, there's a city of 18 million people and every corner has cameras, all facial recognition. So they sit and they know exactly where everybody is of those 80 million people in the city at all times. They track what you spend because everything's digital currency. They track exactly what you buy. If you buy alcohol, you lose points. If you buy water, you get points. They look at your shopping list. They look at how you spend your life. They look at what time you arrive at work. They look at what time you go home. We had married, children, or one child, blah, 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 and it all earns points or loses points. And there's only 18 people, oh, sorry, 18,000 people out of 18, 8 million, yeah, 18,000 out of 8 million that are um, good citizens. <laughs> 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 they get discounts on the train and bits and pieces. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's actually really scary. Yeah. Like that's, they call it the social credit system. Where everything's digitalized and everything's monitored and you're tracked. And if you have you're not paying your debts, they put your face up on the cinemas. Yeah. So you go to the cinemas and all these faces pop up of people who are black blacklisted. Oh. Because their social credit numbers have got so low. And it's yeah. just like and there's one journalist who spoke out about it and he went to buy a ticket to get on a train and it goes rejected, you're blacklisted. Oh. You couldn't even buy a dollar fifty, whatever it was, train ticket because he had spoken out about the government's governance. Yeah. So the metaphor of that story is, you know, that's that's communism or that's f- stuffed up yeah. socialism. Um, but the universe watches. Yeah. It watches to see what our integrity credit is. And our integrity credit is just effort, time, doing the right thing the right way, following through, not cutting corners. All of those things that we know equals a good life. And the reason when most people don't have a good life is they haven't they haven't mm. earned credit. Yeah. I'm a big believer in karma, eh? Like, there's mm. there's a lot to that in the, yeah, I don't know. I suppose I kind of live my life by just saying yes. I just say yes to things and just, and it gets me in trouble sometimes too, but a lot of the time it's about, you know, just putting myself out there. You never know what's going to come of it or what's mm. going to happen. Mm. And that all came around the, around the time I met you. Mm. Um, and we can, 
I suppose we'll start to talk about that a little bit more now as well. But with the, the change of my mindset and then, you know, it's just like, oh, you know, as little as like going out and shouting some beers for the for my mates, you know. Back then I had money, young fella, playing professional rugby, bugger all bills, making a good living and mm. we'd go out and, mm. you know, I'd shout all my mates' beers that were apprentice builders and, yeah. you know, whatever. Struggling. Yeah, struggling. Mm. And we'd go out and we'd have a hell of a night. Oh, it's the waste of money. But <laughs> I had the best time and they it's always come back. You know, that whenever I've needed anything out of any of those guys mm. through life, mm. whether it's financial or whether it's, you know, yeah. a beer. Or a dick. Yeah, yeah, or, <laughs> yeah a dick or whatever. Yeah. Like, it, it just pays itself back. So when you talk about that, you know, the universe watching. And I'm sure everybody listening mm. will have, they'll mm. be able to relate to that. And, mm. and, and it's a genuineness to it. Experience. Yeah. Like, there's a genuineness. It's not a manipulation of yeah. people or places or spaces to get benefit for yourself. <laughs> You know, it, it, it's essence. You know, like I go, if it's the currency, so so, so is social uh, anonymous charity. So if you think about what's the universe taking in as currency, mm. and then karma giving you back, I reckon it's all related. Mm. Is your know, genuine effort, integrity, um, and anonymous service, mm. or on charity that no one knows about giving in a way that no one can get to know but you're making a difference where there's no social um, payback yeah you know like your beers weren't done to then get a deck built later on no. night, right <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it was just a genuine I care about you my friends and I'm happy to look after you because mm. I can yeah. and, and it means we have a good time it's like when you take someone in your car and they want to give you diesel money or whatever it is it's like bro that's an insult. Oh, no, that's mate. That's a, like insulting my gift. Yeah. I actually want to. Yeah. So the, even though their their intentions are lovely one too, but it's just like there's something about that giving. Mm. You know, I don't. I know we try and help our kids understand that, but we live in an era where there's so much abundance, mm. and everything seems to be about getting up. Yeah. Yeah. So no, that that would be. I reckon that's the key part. You're right. The karma bit does yeah. it does come back, and there is always no ancestry is always watching. Yeah, because I I reckon with that with my career, I re- think that's why I had a long career was because of the I, I guess the service I gave to the younger players underneath mm. me. So I genuinely cared about them, and I wanted them to have the experiences that I'd had. Mm. You know, I was so fortunate, played professionally for 19 seasons or 20 seasons, 19 years from the age of 17. I just wanted to, sh- I wanted people to experience what I'd experienced. Mm. I wanted them to feel mm. that euphoric moment of mm. running out to Loftus mm. in a Super Rugby final in front of 60,000 people that hate you. You know, like it's, there's something, so, like you could never reenact that in any aspect of life. And I wanted people to to feel those feelings and like, because I cared about them now, my mates and mm. we worked mm. hard together. Mm. So I wanted to give them every chance mm. to grow, to be able to, mm. you know, enjoy that ride for as long as possible. Yeah. Um, and I reckon that's a big part of why I played for so long because the universe in its funny way. Mm. Well, I suppose if you, even if you look at it face value, those guys never tried to cut me down or to get rid of me because I cared about them and I was helping them. So if you look at it, just, pure factual mm. like the reason I stay in the game so long is because I didn't have a bunch of young guys mm. tearing up behind me trying to pull me down mm. because they were just mm. I was there trying to get them mm. up to my level and then you know yeah. a lot of them carried well past me in terms of what they could do like Quinta Pai great example mm. you know within bloody three months he was 10 times better than I ever was something about that you know if people are listening and wondering about the recipe for success you're already we've already touched on two or three critical things that they can live by every day, which is understanding that the great creator or whatever they believe is always watching and there is a currency as well as, you know, that's integrity effort. And then, you know, we talked about anonymous service and then we talk about there'd be a good team player. So there's three things that people could put on a Sunday night, sit down with a cup of tea and go, where am I going to do those three things this week? Mm. They can do it in their organisation. It doesn't matter if they're a water well tr- driller or a whatever their whatever their station. 
they can do that. So there's already three things that we can, we can people can start to think about. Are they on a continuum of zero to ten? Mm. Where are they with regards to effort? Corner cutting, four or five out of ten. Are they eight, nine out of ten? How much do they give charitable wise in the sense of time, volunteer? You know, easy to put that on your schedule. Mm. Or hard, but easy. Uh, and then that one there. So three good ingredients straight away. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I did want to um, talk a little bit about, I suppose, my change of mindset once mm. I started dealing. Mm. Once you come in, and it was like, a, oh, it couldn't have happened better for me personally the time of my career. So I'd been, was that must have been my second year of Super Rugby. So I'd had a good first year, which often happens, you know, like mm. you get in and, and it's, it's all new yeah. and it's all exciting and there's all this extra emotion yeah. and I guess attention on you so you everything's energy. heightened yeah a lot of energy mm. and you're just and there's that um you know, I call it imposter syndrome like I was like oh do I really belong here so you're just doing everything you can to prove that you belong there yeah. and then all of a sudden you start going well and then it's very easy at that time of your life like I think I was 22 maybe 20 I think I was 21 when I debuted so yeah it would have been 22 very easy to be influenced by what everyone else says about you. So yes. you have a good first year. Yeah. Easy just to yeah, sit cruise. back like, yeah, yeah, I've got this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm totally. the man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then Gats actually was really big for me too around that same time. So he was coaching Waikato mm. um, leading in 2005, 6, 7, I think, before he left. Yeah. And then he was assistant coach in 2007, my first year. And, the Chiefs um, as well, and I worked worked really well with him, him and Fuzzy. Um, he got on to me. I was always a perfectionist, and the listeners would have heard me say this before, and I would never – I never wanted to fail. Like, mm. I just mm. – so I would hold my – purposely hold myself back because I didn't want mm. – you know, I feared failing. Mm. I didn't want to make a mistake. Mm. And then he started to push me to be like, no, you've got to make mistakes to get better. Like, I would rather you try that. Mm. And then, you know, oh, well, it doesn't work out. We'll learn from it. Mm. But don't sit back and not get involved. Mm. Like, you're too good not mm. to mm. Mm. push yourself that little bit more, um, which I kind of – I started to comprehend a little bit and I was trying to bring it into training. But once you come in and gave the Fabio and mm. Frank speech, you know, it just resonated straight away. And I was like, I care way too much about what other people mm. think about me. Mm. And then being able to – like, I still care. I am st- I don't think I'll ever lose that. Yeah, I don't agree. think it, Nor any, should you. I don't think any human no. ever will. The ones that the ones that are, don't have that are very bad. Whatever they're doing, it's not. It's a very very small fraction of the yeah. population. But that small fraction of the population are doing something bad to the planet or bad to others. Yeah, and that's where they live their days. Mm. Yeah, I, I cared a lot about what other people mm. thought, and I'm glad social media wasn't a big thing then because I don't know how I would have personally handled mm. that. But when it came into I guess um, the world, I was in a better place mm. personally mm. with my career and mm. my mindset and being able to deal with pressure. Mm. Um, yeah, I think I f- feel that's pretty hard mm. now for, for younger mm. people going in and I still have, I'm still i still a strong believer that we start, especially in rugby in New Zealand, we start them too young professionally. Mm. Um, and cameras are there way too early. Yeah, way too early. Mm. Like, you know, everything's on, you know, we're setting them up to, you we're know, doing it to them. Yeah, mm. yeah. That's all first 15 rugby's on TV, so we're creating this all this hype when I suppose the big scheme of the world, high school rugby's not that great. You know what I mean? It's like it, it's cool, it's a beautiful It's just first fifteen footy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful game. Yeah. And it's and it's awesome. But in the scheme of it's hyped up to be like super rugby. Mm. Like and and they actually think they are that mm. good, but mm. I can understand why. Like, mm. if all my first 15 games were on mm-hmm. TV, like, mm-hmm. I would have fought the exact same way. I was scoring tries every week, kicking goals, and, you know, like, I would have thought I was the man, and totally. I would have been treated like the man at school too. But back then, no one knew unless they came watch the game. Yeah. And there was only... And this is family. But, yeah, just family. <laughs> and then your old, my old man was never one to pump me up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, he put me in my place pretty quickly. So, yeah, yeah it's just at that timing, of, for me personally was just perfect because then I learned, you know, you came and gave that speech and then I started to realise, okay, I'm worrying about too much about what I'm not doing effective and then I'm also, and I've got the fear of failing 
and I'm worried too much about what other people think. And then through our, I suppose, our sessions, conversations, mm. coffees, mm. you know, over time, well, it didn't even, to be fair, it didn't take long. No. Did it really? No. Like it was. No, it resonates pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And then we, I, the one thing I always remember is the snots, you know, the tackles. <laughs> Mm. So for me, my defense was a big thing that was letting me down, but it was the exact same thing. I was worried about what other people thought. Mm. So I missed one, I'd miss 10, mm. you know, like mm. not mm. 10, mm. but that's that's what would happen because I was just like, oh, shit, everyone's looking yeah. at me and, you know, whatever, and they'd be in the paper. And, and then domino effect. Yeah, yeah, domino effect, and then my whole mind, the psyche was gone, and yeah. you're like, because of shit about how many you miss, how many people are going to smash, <laughs> and how many are going to snot, and then remember we used <laughs> yeah, to count them. Yes, yeah, and, I, and, and check it at half time. Yeah, half time. You'd look at me across the changing room and yeah. hold up your fingers, like how many? Yeah. Or you'd ask me how many, and they'd yeah. hold up how many I thought, and then you'd yeah. come back with yeah. your opinion. And yeah. yeah, and it was amazing just that one flip of like, okay. Mm. And then I went out there with no fear of missing. I was like, who, who am I going to get next? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, and it. Was, Nothing changed. I still practiced the same way. Still the same. Yeah, still had... Nothing know, changed, but everything changed. Yeah, nothing changed, but everything changed. It was the whole mindset thing. Yeah. Do you notice anything different with elite athletes being able to grasp that? Some, or, or is it just some people just grasp it quicker than others? There's, you know, your upbringing really helped you be able to recognise that very quickly and make that small shift that had a massive, well, made a massive magnitude change. So I, I, I like another metaphor is cake and icing. A lot of people are stuck in the icing and they focus on the icing and want the icing and addicted to the icing. And you know, that's the obviously the outcome and the um, targets that they're seeking and they forget to bake the cake. And so there's layers, there's layers to the cake which allow someone to then release into the performance moment and play instinctively. So if you've had a good upbringing... You've already got some good layers um, settled in that cake recipe. Um, if you've missed out on a few things when you've been growing up, then there's more work to do in the foundational stages around baking that cake. Um, but again, you can you can really make those shifts quite quickly because, it, again, it's all common sense. And then once you have those layers in place, you know, like it, I do see athletes respond and fly like you did. Um, and, and depending on their ability as well. You combine that mind shift, mind shift change, bake a great cake, and they're good, and they've got a great coach, and they've got a good trainer, and then you can see some magic happen pretty quickly. Um, so, again, it's like you and I have touched on today a number of times, the, the actual ingredients aren't complicated. The perspective change that comes from that is the key the level of maturity that you have is the critical component to be able to see and make the perspective change. And so if we've got low maturity, it takes longer. Yep. If you've got high maturity, which is no different than as a so zero to five, you've been raised pretty good as an infant, you've been, you know, primary school's been okay and you've done okay there, so now you've got some good flow going, you're going to end up with a pretty mature, you know, 12, 13-year-old if that's happened. And then if high school's been okay, then you're going to hit 18, 19, and you're going to have a mindset where you think you're ready, your maturity's high, and that's a completely different, you know, working with that in that space when maturity's high, the cake flows together real fast. And, you know, you were you were mature for your age, you had a good upbringing, mm-hmm. you've been really grateful, and you know, we talk about your, you know, your routines on game days highlighted that, yeah. how important that foundational stuff was for you, and then we can, we can operate real fast. Yeah. But if it's low maturity, then low maturity usually means that they'll struggle with their weekly habits and their daily functioning. Like they'll be bad at, they won't be so good at scheduling and organising and and keeping the house tidy and yeah, just um, doing those yeah, basics yeah. of life. Yeah. And then and now we're looking at a longer term project because you've actually got to grow the maturity to then to bake the cake to then release from instinct into the performance moment. Because if your maturity is low, it's very hard to then be instinctive in the moment because you're emotional in the moment. And that's the difference. There's a difference between being emotional and being instinctive. Being instinctive is usually a cold, calculated killer. Yep. And they are deadly and accurate and repeatedly accurate. Whereas emotional is can be inconsistent, it can be impulsive, it can be unreliable. 
So there's real difference in that space when you look at the character of performance. So I want someone to be mature with meaning and good, and then you'll get your weekly schedule right and then they'll be ready. Sam King. Yeah, that's yeah. right. But if you're emotional, then something could happen with your girlfriend on Tuesday and you're a rep right through the rest of the week. You haven't done work, you haven't prepared properly, your mind's not in the game, um, you're late for the bus. You know, all these things are repeatedly, you know, for me in my time, the number of players that have been late for buses to pre-season games or late from the hotel. And they're always lower maturity. Mm. So that mark is key. Um, so if we're thinking about growing children to be ready for a high-performance sport, find experiences for them to be mature. And then the rest will take care of itself. Good mm. parenting raises mature, self-reliant, interdependent children. Over-controlling parenting, abusive parenting, neglectful parenting ends up with someone with low maturity and they're always behind the eight ball. Even mm -hmm. if they had the talent, the character is um, uh, not where it could be and the maturity is low and then you've got a huge amount of maintenance around that athlete to help them be in a place where they're ready for coaching, mm -hmm. to do the training, to be prepared. Yeah. and then hold to a game plan and know what their role is, like those basic things. If you're all over the shop during the week, you might have the odd game every now and then where your talent shines because everyone else around you is playing well and gives you a platform and you become the super kid. Mm. But you and I both know those guys have a hell of a road and they are high maintenance for any organisation or coaching crew. It's like, how the hell do we help them get to the game. <laughs> yeah, and you see it, eh? Because you're like, oh, my God, he's brilliant. And yeah. And the next week he's like, like, you just want to pull your hair out. Yeah. Like, how did, like, how yeah. can we go up get that's this right. guy just to yeah. do that each week? Yeah. Like, and then, and I I think that's a big part of why I had a long career too mm. was because I was dependable. So Super I, I didn't I didn't have the big spikes. Yeah. But I didn't have the big troughs no. either. So no like, risk. No, yeah. It was just like the coach knew what they were going to get. And the, I suppose the more experienced I got with that, I understood that. Mm. Where when I was in the moment, I was just doing everything I could, you know, to, mm. to play and mm. to get better and the rest of it. But mm. and I would see, you know, some other teammates would just be like, "Wow, he's mm. the man," mm. and then it'd be like, "Oh, it's shit, he was off today." Mm. But like, I would never mm. really had those games. Like, I'd have to. I, don't get me wrong, I had bad games, but my bad game wasn't horrendous. But it's also, no my really good game wasn't, you know, out of this world either. It was just. Solid. Pretty solid. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, absolutely. Yeah. Maybe um, we just give some thought to, you know, I reckon I like the idea of having across the year, you just pop in every now and then and we just run through some themes mm. and things that might be going on. Um, just to wear the time. That's all yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. You're a busy man, DG. Yeah, it is. It's, 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 it's lovely. It's yeah. lovely that I don't work up Monday to Sunday either, which is quite nice because it just rolls. Yeah, um, I often don't know what day it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, my calendar tells me what day it is. Yeah, yeah. And the sun and the sun tells me what time it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. It's time to go to bed. It's well, got dark. that's right. In the winter it means I have to now wear my torch when I exercise. It's like uh, that. That's where I go. <laughs> okay, you still have to operate. Yeah. But now it's been lovely chatting, and we'll do that. We'll do that. I'm happy to do that. You know, sporadically. Yeah, sorry. totally. Yeah, yeah. totally. No, it's cool. We'll also. Um, the listeners too or chuck some stuff up on social media so if there's anything that yeah. they want to also just chuck it through and I'll, yep. I'll compile Absolutely. a bit of a list and we'll pick our way through it yep. yeah because the I suppose the mind is such an interesting um, yeah interesting space that a lot of people know is important but they don't necessarily mm. understand quite you know didn't have the tools that I had mm. we'll just say that to, mm. Mm. to be able to unleash or unlock that yep. potential that I did have um, and it was real um, awesome hearing the, mm. you know, the old cake analogy and, and, and for people to be able to hear that too because, yeah, yeah it does make, make a big difference. It makes sense. Awesome. Thank cool. you very much, DG. Good start.